Hello, everyone. My name is Victor Jimenez. I'm the executive director of the Outshine Film Festival. Um, I want to welcome you to our watch party and our Q&A for letter, Letters to Eloisa. Uh, but before we get going, I want to say that this, our community partner on this film was Gay Ocho. And I want to thank very much Gay Ocho for being the community partner on this film. It is very much appropriated, uh, appropriate. And then with that being said, we do have a short in, uh, short video that we're going to share from Gay Ocho as a uh, as a uh, for that for you our audience to get to know them. So wait a couple of seconds here, and we will get it going. very much get
Well, thank you very much, Gay Ocho, for being the community partner for our community screening of Letters to Eloisa. Again, my name is Victor Jimenez. I'm the executive director of the Outshine LGBTQ Plus Film Festival. On behalf of the board, staff, and volunteers, welcome to this live Q&A. One thing I want to do add, if you're watching us live, you can send in questions through the chat in um, either uh, YouTube or Facebook, however you're watching us, and then we will um, ask them. So first, I'm going to introduce um, from the Outshine Film Festival, our treasurer, Mr. Christopher Vastine. Chris, please come into the room and turn on your camera. Hey. Hey, thank you, Chris. Hey. All right, um, thank you. Next, we're gonna bring in the director and co-producer of the film, Letters to Eloisa. We have Adriana Bosch. Uh, okay, I am, for some reason, the host uh, has stopped me. So I did start my video. Not there you go, there you go. Okay. I gotcha. Here we are, now let me get rid Looking of Looking good. Okay, great, thank you. Welcome Hi, together. how's everyone? We are doing well. Thank you for being here today. Yeah, then, thanks for being here. Thank you. And then last, we're going to bring in co-producer um, Maria Budes into the uh, the Zoom room here. There you go. Hi, everybody. Hello. Hello. All righty. Well, uh, we got a nice few few. We have a few questions here for your excellent uh, documentary that uh, I'm sure our audience is very curious to hopefully uh, learn the answers to these questions and as well as ask their own. Chris, go ahead. Great, yeah, so thanks again, everyone. Um, so first, you know, uh, how did you discover the letters and what about them made you want to make this film? Well, I ran into the letters by absolute surprise. I was given a little book in 2006 when I was doing a documentary on Fidel Casper. I was given a little book with these letters and it was like, you know, something like this and like this. And I read them and, you know, the way I saw them were sort of a window into the Cuban revolution. But more importantly, I think filmmakers are always looking for that holy grail, which is, you know, especially if you don't have a life character, how do you get into somebody's soul? How do you get into somebody's inner thinking? And the best way to do that is correspondence. So when I ran into these letters, I, you know, I, it was a treasure trove because you could really penetrate this man's suffering, his thinking and, 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 and everything. And, um, you know, I, I knew immediately that I was gonna make a documentary about this man the minute I read those letters because it was just too, too you know, too, 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 too intimate, too important and too revealing to let it go. Great. Excellent, excellent, Adriana. Um, my question to you, um, my question to you and also Maria is, do you feel Oh, there we have a there we got the letters. Yeah, we got the letters. Um, okay. I'll say he and I have actually very similar handwriting, this nice chicken scratch. You do, huh? yeah. Well, you know, the letters are actually the originals are housed at the, I, I should say that at the Cuban Heritage Collection. And so you can, you know, you can go there and you can look at them if you, if you want to. The, where is the Cuban Heritage Collection? Is it at the one there? I'm sorry, it's at the University of Miami and they're all online. Okay. And they're cataloged and, or, and organized and you can actually get in there and, and, and see them all. His sister donated them. He, he, her letters are there. His letters are nowhere. The ones that she wrote to him uh, mm -hmm. We don't know where they are or, or whether they even exist, but she collected all of his correspondence and then donated it to the University of Miami and there at the Cuban Heritage Collection digitized and organized. It's a very nice resource. Oh, excellent, excellent. The, um, so my question actually for the both of you, both of you Adriana and Mar Maria, is um, do you feel that Lizamo was naive about the power of politics and art and culture and that's why he was so apolitical before the revolution and, and actually participated with them initially after Fidel Castro took power. I, I'm not sure he was naive. I think he purposely turned his back on politics. I think in, in, in the 1930s and 40s in Cuba, he decided that he was going to rise above politics, that politics was 
this thing that happened and that he was going to live. And he, he does say it, that he was going to deal with Cuba and with identity and with everything through what he called higher roads. And those higher roads were going to be literature and art and really standing above and aside from, from politics. And that's something he could do in, in, at the time of the Republic. And there's something that he sort of wanted to do at the time of the revolution. But the revolution, in the, under the revolution, everything was politics. So he couldn't, he couldn't no longer stand outside or above politics once the revolution came to power because everything that you did and everything that you said, and you know, it, it, it was eminently, and, and eminently political. So he couldn't do it. Yeah, I would, I would just add that, you know, maybe naive um, is not the right word. Maybe the, the right word is idealistic. You know, he kind of, when the revolution came, he was given a bigger platform than he had ever had before in his life. And um, he kind of felt some sort of final kind of like recognition, you know, because he had been, you know, all these writers had been writing kind of against the current of what was going on in Cuba. And then obviously, you know, once he started feeling the effects of censorship, you know, he realized that this was something that wasn't as idealistic as he had envisioned. I, I mean, that's how I see, I don't know, Adriana, if you, if you think that- No, no, I think that that's correct. I think that he basically um, immediately, uh, I think began within, I would say within three years, two, three years, he began to see that there were real constraints to what could be written and what could be said. And he, uh, you know, he, he the, the interesting thing about Lesama is that he, 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 he marched to his own drummer and he always remained someone independent. He published, he, his mother dies in 1965. There is a coincidence of events here that is very important. His mother dies in 1965. By then he's already kind of beginning to, you can see it in the letters, he's beginning to have his doubts as to where the revolution is going. You know, he sees that there are constraints in, on freedom that he doesn't really agree with. There's lots of scarcities. And we know this because of the letters. And his mother dies and he's been sitting on this novel for a very long time. And the reason he hasn't really published it is because of the homoerotic content, just to get to the idea of the homophobia and the homosexuality right away. And he, it doesn't matter to him that there is a campaign of homophobia in Cuba that is becoming a key issue and that all of this is going on. He's going to publish this novel because he's been sitting on it. And this is, and he's not going to be subject to the policies of this regime at this point. It's his opportunity to publish the novel and to, as one of my interviewees so aptly says, come out of the closet in the way that he knew how to come out of the closet, that he could, which was through his work, through his literature. And so he publishes this, uh, in this novel with this very homoerotic chapters, at least by the standards of the day, in the middle of a great homophobic um, atmosphere that, that has become official policy in Cuba. And he doesn't really, he just does it. And, you know, and that's where the, the troubles begin. Um, so he, 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 he's sort of above, he, he, he's willing to take a hit in order to put himself out there, put his work out there and put his truth out there. And I think that's what makes him truly remarkable in, 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 in this atmosphere in Cuba and in the 1960s. You have to look at this from the point of view of being in Latin America in the 1960s, when a lot of these things are not out in the open. I mean, this is before Stonewall. He's writing before Stonewall and he's writing an openly homoerotic novel. Uh, and, you know, in Latin America, as much as in Cuba, this became a scandal. The only thing is that in Cuba, he had to pay. He had to pay the consequences. Thank you, Adriana. 
the um, actually with your answer there, it was a perfect lead in into actually our treasurer, Chris, Chris's question. So I'll actually ask, ask Chris to come in and ask his question. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, happy to jump in. I mean, so, I mean, you, you, you kind of hinted at this already, but was, was Lozamo like actually, was he an active gay man? Um, meaning was he gay? I mean, we knew he was gay, but did he have like um, the boyfriends or was he out or how, how, how did that work during that time? Well, we know from all kinds of different sources is that he wasn't, he couldn't be out. And, you know, he was a very repressed homosexual. He, but, but, but it was sort of like people knew uh, that he, his friends knew it. And a lot of people knew it. We, you, you, could, you couldn't find him for the longest time. Nobody knew whether he had a boyfriend, what kind of, uh, how did he express his homosexuality in, his, in this highly repressive environment in which he lived personally. Um, you know, he was older now in the 50s and, and certainly in the 60s. And um, nobody really ever knew that, you know, whether he had a boyfriend or not, or how he expressed his outer homosexuality. And, uh, you know, I, 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 of course, tried to get people to talk about it. And eventually, somebody's mother was a very close friend of this man whom he is supposed to have had a real relationship with. And we didn't really put it in the documentary because he was, you know, speculative and you, you had to deal with the family and you had to deal with the information. I didn't want to talk about these things without hardcore um, information, but um, it, it's pretty clear that he did have at least in the 60s, a relationship with a young architect. Uh, very handsome, um, very, you know, very uh, educated, very cultured. I found that he, when I looked at the record of people who'd come to his house and borrow books, he was there almost every night borrowing books from his personal library. Uh, later on, my friend's uh, mother, uh, my, my friend talked about having been at her own mother's house and listening to conversations between this young architect and his mother, where they actually spoke about uh, the relationship between him and Lesama. But there was nothing concrete and, and, and mm -hmm. that, that we could, that we could um, deal with. There, there are all kinds of anecdotes and you know, sure. apocryphal sounds for sure. and this and that. Yeah. That's, the answer is that, yes, he probably did have mm -hmm. someone very close to him for, for, mm -hmm. for, 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 for some time. Yeah, at least emotional int intimacy, it sounds like. Yeah, know. yeah, yeah. And he, he, he lives around it. He lived with his mother until his mother's death. And mm -hmm. then when his mother died, he married his secretary. So, you know, it's, 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 it's a behavior of, 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 of another time that, you know, I, I think it's not that surprising. No, most, most definitely. In um, watching your documentary, and I'm, I'm going to probably share like a, a, a personal uh, a story in this, I got the impression. Um, if you you if you know the 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 author Lydia Cabrera, um, right. and the reason why I bring her up is because I actually I went to her house when she was living in Miami. She was like a yeah. like a, like a distant cousin, and she lived there with her with her partner right. for many years until she passed away. So like I don't, I'm watching your film, I just had memories of like you know visiting her little house. My father would you know take me there and always let me know she was a a great writer and, and the whole Santeria. And I think actually her collection actually went to the heritage thing at UM also. Yes. And I yes. wanted to share that with you. you. You you brought this memory back that I had as a you know a little kid and a teenager going to that in, in the mm -hmm. story. Um, the other thing that was interesting and, I'm, and it's, I'm, it's a lucky coincidence that that um, you know the alleged boyfriend was an, a young architect. The other impression I got from this film was if, if you if if you you, know, you saw or our audience saw like unfinished spaces, um, which, which was a documentary about like the, the the arts and culture buildings that Cuba was building, where right. they were in a rush to build it to do this thing, and one of the architects knew you got to do it fast, otherwise the whole the whole revolution is going to change on us and take away the money. And I got that impression. Uh -huh. um, I mean, did, did, did you get that feeling? You know, feel too from the letters that that did he ever see? You know, like I guess he did. Did he see it coming that they were going to all of a sudden it was all going to go away or and you, I guess you alluded, it, you, you, like you got all the accolades and then all of a sudden it was gone. But in the letters, did he ever feel that it was building, building or was it really that in, instant? 
I think that by by 66, 67, he begins to see that, you know, that the spaces are beginning to narrow. Um, it really, if you look at the trajectory of the Cuban revolution until about 1965, everything seems to be kind of okay. There's some room for artists and for intellectuals. The whole world is watching. So, you know, you have Cabrera Infante, you have Carlos Franchi, you have a very lively intellectual atmosphere in Havana. You have visitors from all over the world. But then you begin to see that the, the debates are beginning to sharpen. And it really begins with, um, with Cabrera Infantes Tres Tristes Tigres and a dispute about Cabrera Infantes Tres Tristes Tigres where the you know, people who are beginning to, who are talking about Havana in a certain way and who are not really with the revolution and uh, are beginning to, to, to present a problem for the revolution. The first instance where you have censorship in Cuba is a little, um, a little short, a little documentary that you know, was the little mouse that roared, if you want to call it that way, by um, Jimenez Leal, who later with Nestor Almendro did no one, Nobody Listen, which was this wonderful first take into the maps and Nobody Listens, uh, Improper Conduct. Uh, where, um, you know, it was into the UMAPs and into the homophobia and into the repression and all that. It was the first time that people leaving Cuba in 1980 began to tell those stories. Um, but Jimenez Leal did a documentary called PM, PM, where he went to um, Regla and to the port where, you know, where the, where the, where the boats used to come and where there were parties into five o'clock, six o'clock in the morning and people were dancing and you saw kind of the under, I wouldn't say the underbelly, but you saw sort of like the off the track uh, nightlife in Cuba. And that's not what the revolution wanted to portray. So Fidel, there was a, a big scandal about it. And then Fidel called this meeting in 1961 at the library, the National Library, where he said his famous words, uh, with the revolution, everything against the revolution, no rights at all. And so that's the first dictum about how to be within the revolution. But he left a lot of room for interpretation. What is with the revolution? What is against the revolution? He never defined that. But that was what became more and more and more defined as the 60s went on and finally became clear in 1971 uh, after the famous Padilla affair and after this great um, Consejo de Cultura, this great meeting where lots and lots of people were called upon. And he basically um, said that the revolution would determine what was published and that if the books were not in accordance to what the revolution wanted and literally not a book, not a, not a book, not a chapter, not a paragraph, not a letter or a word um, would be published of, of, of that book. So censorship became very, very clear. And it took about 10 years for that space to really close. And it was, uh, it was a, um, you know, it was a progressive closing. And so Lesama was caught in it and he, he was able to get Paradiso in there. And by the time that the, the door shut down, he, he, he was already unable to write, but his great novel, his great work that be, put him on the pantheon of the Latin American boom. And, and that, you know, remains kind of a, a hidden gem, you know, and, and, and among Cuban um, uh, uh, Cuban homosexuals of, of, of you know, who, who grew up within the revolution uh, was done by then. So there was nothing they could do about it. What they did do is they never published it again in Cuba until I believe it was 1988, 1990. So there was one publication, 3000 uh, copies were, were, were printed and it was not, and that was in 1966. And it took 22, 23 years for another printing to be 
to be to be um, to be made in Cuba. So the book became like a totem. You know, people would read it within a magazine. People would pass it from one person to the next. It was sort of a hidden a hidden pleasure, um, and and an act of sub subversion, like you know, like uh, passed from hand to hand and and incredibly scarce. And I have a sequence in the film that talks about that and about how the government tried to actually take away some of this, the copies by by doing you know in 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 this book trades that they that they set up what really happened is that the novel got out the novel was published in italy was translated and published in italy and it was it, it first it went to mexico then it went to italy then it went to france then came to the united states the translations proliferated and before you knew it you had a novel that was very well known across the world, but you couldn't find it in Cuba. And when people discuss why, um, you know, there were several reasons why this novel, you know, it was about family, it was about, you know, another era, it was about, um, you know, culture being transmitted from within, not from without, but mostly it's because of its homoerotic content. And if you, it, the most convincing argument that I heard about why Paradiso was never published again and was banned and why he really could not represent Cuba abroad is because the last thing the Cuban government wanted was to have its most important work uh, of literature have homoerotic content and, and, be, and be recognized as such. So, you know, that's, I think, what happened to that work. Yeah, the, um, that's one of the, I was never aware of the book until your film, and I'm like, I, I have to buy this book and read it, <laughs> read it's, it now. It's a tough read. It's a tough read. And, and, and um, <laughs> go ahead, Maria, I'm sorry. Very tough read. I mean, if you think James Joyce is hard, this is harder. It's, uh, you gotta have a, a, a Spanish dictionary at the same time, because he's very Baroque. <laughs> um, and it's very interesting because when you're when you're reading it and you're anxious to get to the famous chapter, right? You're going <laughs> to the, the chapter, which is literally, I mean, I think one of one of the interviewees says, I blushed when I read the chapter. It is so <laughs> graphic and descriptive, it's like brilliant. nothing that had ever been written in Spanish language literature ever before. But it is very interesting because, you know, we grow up. And we read a lot of the writers from that era, you know, Carlos Fuente, so many uh, of the mid-century boom, and you never hear, at least I didn't, I know some you know, people uh, will say, of course we knew about him. I was shocked to discover him. And I think it, it's one of the last sound bites in the film is, um, is what more work could have come of him if he had not, been so you know censored or or had been so isolated and, and and put in a corner you know how much more could we have had from him and that's something we'll never know the answer to yeah yeah but we do have you know i i think that the the, the sadness of it and i and i and i have to i have to thank um jill um i'm sorry I, I just I just blanked out for a second, but someone said that he was an obscure writer, and you know, and I I, I spent my life looking for a word that would um, that would that, that that would define him. It, it you know not a, he was not an unknown writer because in Cuba he was known. He'd be known. He would published the most important. Uh, journal in, in, in Cuban literary history, which was called Origenes. Uh, he was sort of the man that set the parameters of what was culture in Cuba, high culture, literature, what, you know, when the revolution came, he edited an incredible amount of, you know, of, of, of world literature that was made available, you know, to, to people in bookstores for, for hardly any money as part of this, of the revolution's attempt to, to spread and popularize um, a, a high culture in, in, in the early years. 
And, and yet when you get to the seventies, um, after he has written a, a, a novel that has began to be known in world literature, he, you don't see him. You, he's not included in that great pantheon of the Latin American boom. Um, you know, you don't hear his name next to Octavio Paz. You don't hear his name next to Garcia Marquez, Carlos Fuente, and, and, and Vargas Llosa, and, and the rest of them. And that's because if you look at the Latin American boom and all of those people, you know, it's a, it's a mediatic event. It's, a, it, it's, 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 it, it's something that is created by the countries, by the publishers, by, you know, you take all these novels, you put them in a container, you give them a name, and it becomes sort of a world event, the Latin American boom. And these people go to conferences and they get together and they, and he, he, he was never allowed out of Cuba. So he never, he could never become part of that. So he was denied. I think that's the saddest, the saddest um, thing that I, that, that I found in the letters is how this great man was denied his moment in history. And he was denied his moment in history by the Cuban government for fears that, you know, as I explained, that they're not clear. It isn't clear why they feared him. And, you know, one of my interviewees, Emilio Vejel, said, because he was gay, they feared to put him somewhere because he, you know, how could you let this man go out there and represent Cuba? I don't know if that's true. Or because somebody decided to punish him because he was an independent writer and he wouldn't abide by the, by the canons of, of the revolution. I don't know. But the fact is that he wasn't. And, and he knew it. And he, like everyone else, and you know, wanted he, his place in, in the sun and he wanted to be with his colleagues and he wanted to be out there in the world. And they denied him that. And I think that that to me was the heartbreaker. When I read the letters and you know, I remember the first very first treatment that I wrote and I think it was in 2007, 2000, more or less. Um, I remember that was the moment that I built the entire documentary about that moment when his novel was being written about his novel was being recognized it had been translated in the united states the great edmund white had written beautifully about it in the new york times the man was being people clamored clamored for him and he just simply wasn't allowed to leave cuba and go anywhere and promote himself and promote his work and he died um he died in obscurity. He died in obscurity in Cuba, and he died in pretty much obscurity abroad. So that when I, and when the Cuban revolution first, and then I later, and many other people try to revive him, it's very hard because he never really was. Um, he, he never really had the profile that fitted his greatness. His profile never matched his true greatness as an author. And boy, it's so hard to breathe life into, into, into that story. I, it took me decades, you know, a mm. decade really to get funding to make this documentary. Finally, the NEH and Latino Public Broadcasting uh, put up some money, but it was like, I don't know him. Who is he? Why don't you do something? You know, I mean, we don't know who he is. And you keep saying, but he's great and he's very significant. Yeah. No, absolutely. I mean, it's absolutely uh, fascinating yet, 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 yet heartbreaking at the same time, you know, that uh, this really amazing figure that, you know, was. Um, a was sort of cut short, but also, you know, we just, it's, we did, we're just kind of discovering now, but just, I mean, it's just incredible that, you know, you're able to tell this story through the film and we're just uh, so, so thankful for that um, for sure. Um, yeah, I would love to hear, I mean, I mean, this is a, you know, the, the amazing project of sure, for sure, but certainly would love to hear kind of what uh, as artists, both of you are still up to um, or what your next project going to be. So maybe Maria, I could ask you to answer first and then, you know, Adriana as well. Well, there's, I, I noticed that there was a question from the, um, was there a, a question? Oh, let me look at the question. It said, 
something about, uh, do you think <laughs> that Little Havana and Cuban communities know about him and how important is it directly to the life of LGBTQ Hispanics here? And I, I, I think that came in, right? <laughs> Yeah, no, that's uh, looking at it. Yeah, that question is. Yeah, yeah I, you know, you, you, you want to take that? I, I, you know, you can you can answer that if you if if you you can take a little bit of that. I can I can pick it up as as well. You know. Yeah, let's do that. Yeah, yeah. Why don't you take that on, Maria? Well, you know, I think it's that's an interesting question because it's there's. I remember uh, when I, you know. When I came out myself in the late 70s here in Miami, uh, before I moved away from Miami, um, that, that was the Anita Bryant days and Miami was extremely uh, homophobic and you really kind of wanted to never reveal you were gay because, I mean, we're talking about during the times when going to go see a Cuban film at the Cinematheque could mean a bomb threat. So uh, I don't know how, I think we've evolved as a community in Miami and, 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 and we're not as homophobic and uh, oppressed as we felt back then, but these attitudes still prevail. So I think it, it is important to have people that reflect that it's not, you know, this is not something that is because uh, a perversion, as we were uh, used to be called when we were younger, you know, a, a ideological perversion. You know, this is this repression has existed since we existed as a nation, and uh, I think that it would be great to teach about him here and to have more, more of the real Cuban culture and identity taught here. You know, you 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 run into people who are 100% Cuban and yet they don't really understand their history and they don't really know who their authors are and who their artists are. It's all very present day. So I think it is it is a good opportunity to teach our history and our culture and our struggle. I think it boils down to one simple sentence. I mean, Cuba's greatest writer of the 20th century was gay. That to me is, 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 is fantastic and something that needs to be brought out and, and not, and not um, at all obscure. I mean, the idea that yes, indeed, the greatest Cuban intellectual recognized worldwide, other than Jose Marti, you know, for those people who are Martianos, other than Jose Marti is Jose Lezamalima. And Jose Lezamalima was a gay man and wrote a novel with very strong homoerotic content and published it. And the novel became famous worldwide and before anybody else in Latin America or anywhere else dared write, not everywhere else, but in Latin America, certainly in Spanish letters, dare write this stuff, he wrote it. And, and I think that is something that is, 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 is a source of pride and a source of, of cultural affirmation um, for us as a nation and certainly for, for, for gay Cubans of, you know, women, men, trans, whatever, um, you know, you, you to, to know that in your own culture, I mean, the most significant intellectual of your 20th century was a homosexual and wrote a homosexual, not entirely homosexual novel, a novel with strong homosexual content ahead of many of the writers that came later on. Uh, and, you know, in, in, the 19, in the early 1960s. I think that that should be uh, definitely something that, that we ought to be proud of and, and, and emphasize. Great. Well, thanks so much. Um, I guess uh, I know I started to cut you off earlier, but you know, would love to hear some of maybe your new projects and anything you have coming up. Maybe Maria, we'll start with you and Adriana. You can tell us what's what are you up to next because we want to see more. Um, sure, I'm working with a New York filmmaker. Uh, we're developing a documentary on 
uh, Justice Sotomayor, and um, we're very excited to tell her story of the wise mm. And uh, that's my next project. Wow, can't wait to see that. I, I don't know what I'm doing. I, you know, <laughs> I have a bunch of ideas floating around. I am not. Um, I am not certain about what my next project is going to be. But um, one of the things that I, you know, considered was um, uh, my video went off. I'm sorry. One of the things that I considered was indeed doing something on um, on. Um, I'm sorry. Uh, start my video. Now I got distracted. Okay, there we go. Um, you know, I, 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 we were doing something, Maria and I were collaborating on something about 1980, Miami 1980. I have an idea of doing a first lady, um, you know, who will remain unnamed for now. And starting, uh, I think there is a, a trend uh, in, for, for PBS to do a series on first ladies that I might be I might be part of that. And, uh, you know, um, Lydia Cabrera, I thought about hard and I think it would be a fantastic story. She has there's some video and some interviews about her, um, you know, but the way I looked at it is I need to take a real rest from having Don Lezama to do Lydia Cabrera because, you know, reviving these figures that are very well known in Cuban uh, for us Cubans, but internationally somewhat not is, 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 is and certainly not among Americans in, in, in you know, the, the wider public is, is very hard. But Lydia Cabrera was also somebody I was thinking about, about, uh, about getting into. And uh, it's, you know, it's a fascinating story. She's a wonderful, wonderful uh, a character. So, you know, we'll see. She is a character. We do have one final question from the audience, and then um, I guess we'll we'll close it out by showing the trailer for the Letters to Louisa after. But uh, what final words uh, can you offer the LGBTQ plus community here in South Florida and to the Cuban and Hispanic people in general? Honor your find your. I, I'm a historian. I'm a, hist I'm, a, I'm a producer of history documentaries. I, 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 you know, that's what pulls me. That what that's what nourishes me. That's what you know captures me. And and I think that we need to build our our pantheons, and we need to um, to really honor and 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 bring out uh, the people that really, you know our children, and Maria was very, very eloquent about that, our children should look up to, and in our own history, present, uh, you know, uh, the history we're making and the history that has come before. And, um, and, and make sure that those people get highlighted in, in, our, in, our, in our literature, in our arts, in, in you know, in, in all of, 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 of the endeavors of, of that have to do with politics and culture and everything else, because those are the role models that we need to pass on to to our children as we build our you know our our culture. So that's what I would say, Maria. It's 2020. I only have one word. Please vote. Well, well, thank you very much. Um, I think we had a great Q and A. Oh. Thank you very much. I think we had a great Q&A and, &A, and um, I, I, I'm gonna pass it off to Chris and he's gonna do a final thank you to you and to the audience. Thank you. Great, you yes. Much. Yes, Maria, please everyone out there vote, 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 vote. You know, we see so how much really what's at stake. So um, yeah, but wow, what, a, what an amazing discussion and such what, what, to kick off one of our early days of the, the virtual festival. Um, um, you know, Adriana as well as Maria, thank you so much for your time. Um, beautiful film and we all look forward to watching it all together thank um, you thank you for having us and good luck for the rest of the festival and we're excited yeah, some films too. Yeah. great I, i've <laughs> seen some of the offers uh, in 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 a prior in a prior meeting and you, you guys have a great lineup and i yeah. you know i wish you the best and you know i think that um, 
the drivings are going to be fantastic. And, you know, congratulations. Yeah. Thanks so much. And uh, one last final thank you to our audience and everyone who's tuned in. Um, we look forward to seeing you at the movies this week. Thanks all. We wake up and mother tells me, I dreamt that it was raining when Eloy was leaving. Los cruzanos, los privilegiados. My most beloved Eloisa, we have all fallen victim of the stupidity, the misery, and the confusion of our times. It wasn't just with the revolution that Lezama became an oracle. He had been an oracle before. Lesama was asthmatic, Catholic, gay, secretly gay. Paradiso was Lesama's personal coming out. Que no confundan la serenidad de la revolución con debilidades de la revolución. Politically, it was a, a bomb. Noche insular, jardines invisibles. A él le interesaba mucho la literatura exquisita, la literatura de enorme refinamiento, irrita a la revolución. Él representa algo que es combatido por el Estado revolucionario cubano, que es la autonomía del escritor. Ni se le publican libros, no aparece en revistas. He is being surveilled and watched by all of his neighbors. He is alone in a way that he has never been alone. What has given him life, his entire existence, ceases to exist. Dear Eloy, if there is no freedom, there is no possibility, there is no image, there is no poetry. If there is no freedom, there can be no truth. <laughs>